When most people think of the Grimm brothers, the first thing that comes to their mind is their collection of rather messed up fairy tales. Fairy tales that feature murder, torture, cannibalism, and of course, religious piety. I know, one of these things is not like the other, but the Grimm brothers were all about praying to the powers that be, and today's stories showcase that, as well as the trickiness of elves and how evil those little monsters can be. You see, when the Grimm brothers released their collection of fairy tales back in 1812, there was a total of more than 200 stories across both volumes. But out of those 200 tales, there was only one that contained multiple variants where each story was more messed up than the last the elves and the shoemaker, and today we're covering its messed up origins. Before we dive in though, I just want to let my fellow folklore fanatics know that we just dropped a brand new limited edition holiday sweater featuring everyone's favorite demonic goat, Krampus. And you have the option of sending a boy or a girl to the fiery pits of hell. Whether you're trying to weird out your relatives or keep the old pagan traditions alive and well, these will get the job done. Just make sure you order them ASAP because they're only available until New Year's Day. The link to meremortals.store is in the description and pinned comment. The stories that we're covering today start out pretty tame, but get progressively darker, and by the end of this episode, you're only going to trust elves as far as you can throw them. Which for most people is probably pretty far because elves are small, but I personally don't like throwing things because my shoulder pops out of its socket like a third of the time, so that's where that analogy comes in. I don't know who was responsible for building my body, but they definitely got my rotator cuff on Wish. Now I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the general storyline of Elves and the Shoemaker, but for those who aren't, you should know that it's about elves and a shoemaker. Does that clear things up? Fine, I guess I'll elaborate. This first story, which was titled The Shoemaker for Whom They Did the Work, follows an impoverished, destitute shoemaker who, through no fault of his own, is going totally broke. One evening, he started crafting what he expected to be his last pair of shoes for quite some time. But after cutting the leather, he was tired, so his wife convinced him to get some sleep and finish what he started in the morning. He laid out his tools so he'd be ready to work bright and early, said a prayer, kissed his wife, and went to bed but when he woke up, he was met with a most unusual surprise. Sitting on his workbench where the leather cut should have been was a pair of shoes, but not just any shoes, these appeared to have been made by a true master. Not a single stitch was out of place, and the moment that he placed them in the window for sale, a customer rushed into the store, saying she liked the shoes so much, she would pay double the asking price. Probably not the best financial strategy for the customer, but the shoemaker was in a desperate state, so he wasn't gonna say no. Plus, the additional funds allowed him to buy enough leather for two pairs of shoes. That evening, the shoemaker went to work cutting the leather, and once again headed off to bed with when he was about halfway done with the intention of finishing them in the morning. But once again, when he woke up, the shoes had been finished. This cycle repeats a few times. The shoes that keep mysteriously completing themselves sell for double, sometimes triple the price. And as word gets around town that they're the best shoes money can buy, his business begins to boom. The shoemaker continues to reinvest his profits into his business, buying new materials, tools, what have you. But the one thing that doesn't change is that he leaves his unfinished projects on his workbench every night. Then every morning, he finds that beautiful new shoes have been made, and over time, he becomes a considerably wealthy man. Then, a few days before Christmas, he suggests to his wife that they stay up together and see who's been giving them a helping hand. I'm not sure why he didn't think of that sooner, but maybe he just didn't want to jinx it. His wife thought this was a good idea, so that night they lit a candle and hid themselves behind some clothes that were hanging in the corner. Then, at about midnight, two naked little men entered the shop. You heard me right, naked little men. In later editions and adaptations, they're in crappy little rags, but the very first publication described them as totally naked. It also never specified that they were elves. That was a change made in the English translation. In German, they were called things or creatures. Well, these bare-butted boys amazed the shoemaker and his wife with their skills. They worked so quickly and nimbly that the shoemaker couldn't take his eyes off them until the job was done and they ran away. He swore to his wife that he was just impressed with their skills 
couples though. His staring had nothing to do with them being naked. The following morning, the couple was getting the store ready for another busy day when his wife suggested they do something special to thank the mysterious little men for making them so rich. She pointed out how cold they must be since they were running around with either no clothes or crappy ones and decided that she'd make them some shirts, jackets, undershirts, trousers, and stockings while the shoemaker made them some tiny shoes. That evening, they left out the gifts where they would normally leave the unfinished shoes and waited. At midnight, the elves came skipping into the shop ready to work, but when they saw the little clothes instead of the cutout leather, they got super excited. They sang, they danced, they shook their little butts. It was a great time for everyone. When their celebration was over, they skipped out of the shop hand in hand and never returned but that was no concern to the shoemaker and his wife. Not only were they grateful for the elves help and for being able to return the favor somehow, but their business continued to prosper and they lived happily ever after. So that is part one of the elves and the shoemaker story and the part that's been reimagined the most in modern media. In addition to clever references like the elves who make shoes in the elf movie. Lazy bum, couldn't even make a clock. There have been straight up adaptations like the 1930s animation, which has that classic rubber hose limb style that I just love. But the one that I grew up with was the Hallmark Timeless Tales animation from 1990, which I managed to find a janky version of here on YouTube. The Muppets also put their own creative twist on the tale with their version, The Elvis and the Shoemaker, where the magical helpers are not elves, but Elvises, and the beautiful shoes they save the business with are blue suede shoes. Let me know if you recognize any of these adaptations, or if I missed the one that you're most familiar with, because I'm always curious to hear how people get introduced to these stories. Now, I want you to remember the wholesomeness of the story we just went through, though, because these next two stories, the Grimm brothers included with the elves and the shoemaker go down a much darker and less wholesome path. But before we dive into those, if you want to take your business, hobby, or passion project to the next level, then you won't need magic little helpers to do it. You could just use our sponsor, Squarespace. From their massive library of award-winning website templates to their intuitive interface that lets you customize your site by simply dragging and dropping, Squarespace gives you the power to design a beautiful and effective website with no prior experience. Want to create a gallery to show off your artwork, sell your own merchandise, or start a newsletter to keep your community informed? You can do all of that and more. And because Squarespace knows how important a website is for the success of any business, they give their users access to marketing tools and and analytics so we can make sure our website is running efficiently. And they offer personalized customer support 24-7 for those rare occasions it's not. So whether you're trying to establish your business's online identity or you want to get professional with your passion, you can go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to start your completely free trial. And when your site is ready for launch, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain and support the Messed Up Origins podcast. All right, so this next story is just straight up weird. I know, we never cover weird stories on this show, but there's a first time for everything, right? This tale, originally titled The Servant Girl Who Stood In As Godmother For Them, follows a poor servant girl who's basically a Cinderella-type character. She spends her days sweeping, cleaning, and cooking for the family she works for but unlike Cinderella, they don't seem to mistreat her. They're actually pretty chill as far as fairy tale families go. The reason I say this is because one day the servant girl picks up a pile of mail and notices that her name is written on one of the envelopes, but she doesn't actually know how to read, so she takes the letter to the family and has them read it to her. They inform the girl that the letter is from the elves and they're inviting her to serve as godmother at the baptism of one of their children, to which the girl responds, you're messing with me, right? I know I can't read, but I'm smart enough to know an elaborate ruse to get me to show up somewhere that you're going to tar and feather me when I see one. But the family said that was ridiculous. If they wanted to tar and feather her, they could do it right now, and there is nothing that she could do to stop them. Absolutely nothing. They insisted the letter really was from the elves and that it wouldn't be right to reject them. A few days later, three elves showed up at the house and took the girl into a hollow mountain where they lived. Everything there was small, but super fancy. There was a bathtub made of gold, a cradle of ivory, and the new mother was lying in an ebony bed decorated with pearl buttons and a gold blanket. The girl stood in the baptism ceremony and accepted the role of godmother. 
then she requested to go home, but the elves were insistent that she stay with them a few days, and she felt awkward turning them down because they were just so polite. Over those next three days, she had everything she could have wanted, and the time passed by quicker than expected. But finally, she did get to return home with her pockets filled with gold, a thank you gift from the elves. But something strange occurred when she got home. After picking up her broom from the same corner she left it in, she resumed her usual routine but some people that she didn't recognize came rushing out of the house, demanding to know who she was and what she was doing there. Confused, she tried to explain her situation to them, but the more they talked, she realized the truth about what happened. She wasn't gone for just three days, but rather seven years, and during that time, her former employers died. The end. All right, I know that was sudden, but that really is how it goes down. My understanding is that similar to how the shoemaker was rewarded for his hard work and prayers to God, this girl was blessed after choosing to attend the baptism. The craziest part is that other stories very similar to this one have been found in multiple countries. Sweden, Switzerland, Ireland, and England, to name a few. The storyline usually follows the same format, but the creature in question changes. Like in Sweden, they're called trolls, and in Ireland and England, they're fairies. The lesson this next story teaches isn't quite as pious, though. In fact, when you know the real-life inspiration behind it, it's pretty dark. So this next tale is titled The Woman Whose Child They Exchanged, and if you've been tuning into Messed Up Origins for a while, or you're just a folklore fan, you might already know where this is headed. The story opens with a woman's child being abducted from its cradle by elves, and in its place they left a look-alike with some distorted features, like a thick head and big ol' eyes. The look-alike spent all of its time eating and drinking, to the point where the woman could not keep up with its appetite. So she went to a neighbor and asked for advice. The neighbor told her that her baby must have been replaced with a changeling, a fairy look-alike that's meant to act as a replacement for a human baby so it can enjoy the copious amounts of love, attention, and nutrients that little fairies are normally deprived of. Then she told the woman how to test to see if the baby was indeed a changeling and gave some of the strangest instructions she'd ever heard. The woman went home, brought her baby into the kitchen, set it near the hearth, made a fire, and, get this, she boiled water in two eggshells. I know, it sounds crazy, but that was actually the point. When the baby saw her doing something so ridiculous, it couldn't help but laugh an authentic, <laughs> creepy fairy laugh, and it stated that despite being as old as the trees, he's never seen anyone cook in eggshells. Then, a band of little elves suddenly appeared around him, along with the woman's real child. Then they returned her baby and took back the fake one and were never seen again just when they started getting along, too. What a shame. All three stories today could be considered creature features because the events center around the actions of mythical little monsters, but depending on how many rodent hairs you want to split, we could get real technical with what the creature should be called. Elves is a decent catch-all term that easily applies to all of them because elves can either be ambivalent or a total pain in your pee hole, but there are similar creatures found in other countries that could fit under the elf umbrella but deserve a distinct classification of their own. Consider the elves in the classic Elves in the Shoemaker story. They're helpful, do household chores with nothing expected in return, and any piece of clothing you give them is a get out of indentured servitude free card. Now you know where J.K. Rowling got her inspiration for house elves. The elves in the shoemaker was collected from Germans by Germans, but if we head over to Ireland, similar stories can be found starring creatures called pukas, while Scotland has its own hairy helper known as a bruni. Then there's the fairy lookalike from that third story. What was that about? That, my friends, is known as a changeling, a creature that families all across Europe seriously feared. Whenever they noticed their friends or loved ones behaving abnormally, be that different than how they've acted in the past or just behavior that's atypical for humans, accusations of changelings were thrown around and on some occasions even ended in brutal executions. Truly terrifying stuff when you consider that the abnormal behaviors were more often than not 
just a symptom of physical and mental disabilities like Down syndrome, autism, and even postpartum depression. If you wanna learn more about the very messed up origins of house elves or changelings, then I'll put the links to both of my episodes about them in the description. Between the two, that is 40 minutes of folklore goodness, and I go much deeper in those episodes than I could in this one without straight up copy pasting them. But now you know just about everything there is to know about the elves and the shoemaker. Wasn't this such a wholesome way to start off your holiday season, at least until we started creeping up to the border of eugenics at the end? Let me know your thoughts on the story and what version you're most familiar with by leaving a comment down below. Then remember to sacrifice those like and subscribe buttons because it helps the channel a lot and that way you'll get more messed up content on folklore and mythology sent to your sub box every single weekday. Also, don't forget to order your Krampus sweatshirts because they'll be gone in a few short weeks. I'll see you all again next week when I dive into another Christmas time classic, The Nutcracker. Until then, my name is John Solo and remember, John shot first.